Hey everyone and welcome back to another explore around King's Lynn in Norfolk. After our walk around at Castle Acre, just literally down the road from here, we visit Castle Acre Priory. With over 450 years worth of being the home and workplace to monks and their servants, this priory is a significant example of the first Cluniac order of monks to England. Join us for an explore at these extensive and stunning ruins. Castle Acre Priory is one of many Norfolk Castle ruins which remain very much intact today. It oozes historical importance for both Norfolk and for England. And as you wander around the well-kept grounds, you get a very good idea of what it must have been like to live and work here. Known as one of the largest and most impressive monastic sites in England, this site is home to the first Cluniac monks, hence the importance of this particular ruin. Interestingly, it's also one of the most best preserved priories in the UK, and after walking around here, you can very much agree with that statement. Making our way over to the Priory, your first line of sight is the incredible West End front of the Priory. We were just wowed by this, as many people more than likely are. And you can see just how sophisticated and flamboyant the decoration is. It stands almost to its original height, and the arcading and carving is just mesmerising to look at. It's said to be one of the glories of English Romanesque architecture, and just by looking at it, you would rightly assume that this place was built for the rich and powerful. And later, in the 15th century, the west front was altered dramatically when the smaller round-headed windows were knocked and replaced with larger windows, with a pointed arch. Even with this and the exception of the loss of the tops of the two towers, you are still very much reminded of how grand this building once was, and actually still is. The West Front acted as a spectacular introduction to the interior of the church beyond the three doors. The richly decorated carvings include some very typical and distinctive architecture of that time. These include the interlaced arcading and the zigzag decoration lacing the arches on the doorways and windows and many of the other outlandish corbels. This style is thought to be decorative, not symbolic, and is a prominent reminder of the Priory's patrons, the Warren Earls of Surrey, who wanted to show their religious devotion by building to the highest quality they could, regardless of the expense. The nave of the church is the oldest part of this Priory's ruin, but like many of the other Priories in Norfolk, such as Binham Priory, it was dissolved in 1537 under Henry VIII. This priory was eventually passed to the Coke family of Holcombe Hall, where both the priory and castle are still owned by the present Earl of Leicester. Although, again, this site is also maintained by the English heritage. This church is pretty remarkable, and the nave had seven bays and a choir of two, which were both aisled. It's also so impressive to be able to wander up to the altar and take in the views.
During this time, the Priory grew wealthy again, with royal grants from both King Henry I and his grandson Henry II. They exempted the Priory from tolls, which back then was a very valuable benefit for a monastery with such extensive lands as Castle Acre. Nobles, merchants and even royalty stayed at the Priory. This included King Henry III and King Edward I with his Queen Eleanor, who stayed here on the way to the Shrine at Walsingham. Like many monasteries, Castle Acre contained all of the buildings in which a community would have needed. These included a church for the pilgrims and the services of the monks, domestic buildings like a refectory for communal meals, some kitchens, an important chapter house, lodgings for the prior, and many storerooms. They were all here and they all grouped around an enclosed courtyard or cloister. Just slightly away from the cloister, an infirmary was built and used by the monks who needed to recover from any illnesses. The cloister is to the south of the nave, and as mentioned before, the cloister was a courtyard that surrounded the domestic quarters of the monks and was both geographically and symbolically the centre of the priory. Most of the buildings around the cloister are actually ruinous now, but it's quite easy to map it out today. The chapter house and the dormitory are on the eastern side and the lodgings for the prior are rather west. In many orders, the monks would have spent a considerable amount of time in the cloister. When not singing services, the monks were expected to sit in the cloister for religious study. Founded in 1089, the Priory was originally situated within the castle. And if you're interested, in our last video we explored here and its extensive remains. But it proved to be too inconvenient, so it was moved just down the road to its present site about a year after the castle was built. This site was more accessible by the River Nar as well, as it increased resources that enabled them to begin the construction of the existing buildings at the Priory. But building works progressed slowly. The church was not blessed until around 1146 to 1148, and its west end was completed only in the 1160s. The monks would have moved from the castle's bailey to their new site in the 1100s, but they would have lived in timber buildings whilst the rest of the Priory was completed over the following 50 years. Towards the end of the 13th century, the Priory suffered when England went to war with France due to its French connections, even though most of the monks here were actually English. The community shrank, more likely due to money troubles, and in 1325 the Priory obtained English status, and later in the 14th century it saw a revival of a number of improvements to its buildings, and the community was able to build again once more. The prior was head of the site, he was in charge of the monks, and his rooms were always bigger and more luxurious than others. The outer parlour is on the ground floor, where the prior had and held meetings, but the monks were only able to get to it from the cloister and visitors could only access it from the front entrance. In the corner, you'll see a spiral staircase that leads up to the surviving upper rooms. These rooms enclose the prior's great chamber and solar. The great chamber was lavishly decorated and in 1510, a large fireplace was added, as was the large bay window, which was once filled with stained glass bearing his initials and his motto. The ceiling were also painted with red and white roses, symbols of the Tudor king, Henry VIII, who ironically was the one later to demolish and close the priory down. The windows were also purposely facing the West End church, 
so that the prior could look upon his estate and his surroundings. Just off from the chamber is the prior's chapel. This room was both a religious building that was devoted to worship, but also a badge of rank. Again, its lavish decoration was very elegant and showed off the wealth of the priory, but it was also very similar to the chapels of royal palaces and castles. The chapel contained numerous fragments of painted decoration with tiny patches of clothing, a crown and stars with gold. The fireplace and the windows are really interesting to see and it's just so beautiful and nice to see these buildings still very much in great condition. This building was the latrine block. It was carefully designed and situated and convenient for a large community of monks. It contained all of the latrine functions at cloister level for the day and adjoining dormitory for the nighttime. It is one of the best preserved in England and is a two-storey building. The vaulted lower level could be entered from the cloister during the day and the upper floor was connected by a bridge and was available only during the night for the monks. A total of 24 toilets were provided and they consisted of wooden seats with holes in the centre, as a normal toilet would have, but they were designed to be set over chutes that ran down into a stone lined channel. Running water would be diverted here from the River Nar, carrying the waste away. Much of the eastern range was occupied by the massive dormitory on its upper floor. This was a single long room in which the monks slept and was built in the mid 12th century. Later on in the Middle Ages, it became a common practice for the monks to be given individual cells and beds for privacy and dignity rather than to sleep together in a single long room. Unfortunately, no real sign of this indicated that there were partitioning of walls but it was common in monasteries of that era to do so. We then take a wander over to the western part of the monastic precinct at the 19th century barn and farm buildings, which replaced a medieval barn that was demolished in 1838. 
To the south of this is a court that's enclosed on the north, probably constructed in the 15th century and may have included a granary, a storehouse, a corn dryer with a brewery and a malt house. Some would say this would be the most important building of the Priory, but it's really fantastic to be able to see the outlines of the kilns. This place is wonderful, like the castle just up the road. It is so recommended just to visit both and have the full experience. And you can totally just understand how these two sites come together and the importance that it once had. The site is very well maintained with a shop, lots of information, friendly staff, and the usual toilets, free parking, and a shop. You're able to get hold of an audio tour with your ticket, or you can walk the ruins without and grab a sense of imagination where the people would have once walked and slept. Either way, Norfolk has not disappointed us. In fact, we hope to return again soon to enjoy the more wonderful places here and hope you'll join us too. So if you've enjoyed watching our visit to Castle Acre Priory, please be sure to hit that like button, click that notification bell, and consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. It helps us massively. We would love to say a big thank you to our Patreons and a big thank you to all of those who choose to watch and support us in our videos. Be sure to keep checking back for our next video. Till next time.